Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I can't think of a more appropriate topic or better guests and a moderator. So thanks for being here. Um, I think I may uh, have already uh, old information, but as of now, at least 15 million people have been infected with COVID-19 and 600,000 have died across the world. This pandemic has brought fear, grief, disruption, and extreme loneliness for many people. The pandemic has also laid bare, made visible in ways that cannot be unseen, the extreme social, economic, and racial inequalities in this country and elsewhere. Tonight's guests have extraordinary expertise in how all of us and our family members could navigate the challenges that this moment poses to our physical and our emotional health. And we're extremely grateful to both of them for joining us. Kimberlyn Leary is Senior Vice President of the Urban Institute. She is also Professor of Psychology and Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management at Harvard. She's a lecturer as well in the public policy area at Harvard Kennedy School. Kim formerly served as an advisor to President Obama's White House Council on Girls and Women, and she was the White House Health Division lead on the Flint water crisis. In her work, Kim has focused on improving physician community relations, on access to health care for underserved communities and communities of color. She has done research and taught extensively on conflict resolution. She is a current trustee of Amherst College, which is fortunate for us all. She graduated from Amherst in 1982 with a major in psychology. Thank you for being here, Kim. Pleasure. I believe Kim also has a birthday on Friday, so an early happy birthday. <laughs> Thank Dr. you. Dr. Paula Rausch is a former trustee, a trustee emerita of Amherst College and a graduate in 1977 with a double major in biology and psychology. All of us on the Board of Trustees miss Paula every time we have a meeting. She's the founding director of the Marjorie E. Korf Parenting at a Challenging Time program at Massachusetts General Hospital. PACT provides individualized guidance to parents for supporting their children's emotional health during and beyond parental illness. She is board certified in adult, child, and adolescent psychiatry. Paula Rausch is a consultation child psychiatrist who specializes in the impact of medical illness on families and on the emotional health and well being of children. She has practiced at the Massachusetts General Hospital since 1982 and is an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Paula is also the inaugural incumbent of the Timothy Christopher Davidson Chair. Of, of psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Paula, thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you. And Mike's moderator is Julia McQuaid, Associate Professor of Psychology right here at Amherst College. And how fortunate we are to have Julia McQuaid here. Her research focuses on the interplay of the cognitive, biological, and environmental processes that influence the social and emotional functioning of children and adolescents. Her courses include abnormal psychology, child and adolescent clinical psychology, introduction to psychology, and others. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to Professor McQuaid. Thank you so much, President Martin, and welcome Paula and Kim. It's so nice to have you here. I'm thrilled to be moderating this. So I'm a clinical psychologist and much of my recent work has really been focused on the role of stress and how we see differential vulnerability in the context of stress 
and the types of environmental factors that can either exacerbate it or help to mitigate it. And so tonight's topic, I think, is so timely. We'll be talking about mental health and emotional well being in the summer of 2020. Um, a couple housekeeping things. So we will be recording this talk tonight so that those who can't tune in live will have a chance to watch it. There's also an opportunity for audience members to submit questions. So there should be a box that appears to the right of your screen. Feel free to submit a question. We have a couple things that we're gonna chat about to start us off, and then we'll be eager to hear from what you all are interested in, in learning about. So as a place to start, Kim and Paula, I thought we should start by having both of you tell us a little bit about your work experience. Um, and in particular, what are you doing now? What's changed since March um, in the context of these multiple crises that we find ourselves in? Kim, could we start with you? Sure, thank you, Julia, and thank you, Biddy, and hello, Paula. It's really great uh, to be with all of you this evening. And it's really exciting to have three mental health professionals that we'll have a conversation uh, together with all of you. So as you heard, I wear uh, three different hats or more, depending on the day. Um, and March feels like it's about 100 years ago. Uh, when I think about what's changed in my work, uh, like the experience that Julia has had at Amherst, I had to transition my course at the Kennedy School of 100 students in an experiential leadership class to go from the residential classroom to Zoom uh, with about three days notice. And as students were repatriating around the whole world, many of them only at the Kennedy School for a year, uh, two things changed. First, my class was a class on uh, leadership and authority, and it became a class on leading under conditions of crisis. The second is with students uh, who, whose lives changed so abruptly, my role as a professor changed. And part of the work that I did uh, in class, actually, in the context of the teaching, was to help students to um, hold and manage the grief that they were feeling on their own personal behalf. They had family members who were ill, uh, great uncertainty about whether they'd be able to graduate on campus. Ultimately, they were not. Um, and just losing a precious period of time that they'd expected at Harvard. So uh, all of a sudden at that moment, you're a teacher as well as someone who is engaging with students to hold them through uh, a massive calamity. And then I would say that, you know, um, as, a, uh, as a person who works in public policy and I just started this new role at the Urban Institute three weeks ago, you know, I've started a new position uh, at, at a distance. I have yet to meet in person most of the people that I'm working with. Um, and if I can just step back a, a little bit too, I would say that, you know, what's really changed is, you know, not just the technical parameters of how we all work, but, you know, we started off in March with the pandemic really thinking that this was a collective challenge that affected all of us and might even bring us all together in some way, uh, despite the pain and suffering. But as the challenge uh, has changed, as we've become aware that COVID doesn't affect all of us equally and disproportionately affects communities of color and low income communities. And then with the violence that's taken place uh, uh, in with George Floyd's death um, and the civil unrest that's followed, uh, I think we've uh, realized that we're having to together um, uh, accept, understand, metabolize, figure out what we're going to do about an America that looks very different than many people expected was the case in 2020. Thank you so much, Kim. Paula, could you tell us a little bit about your work and, and how things have changed for you? Yes, absolutely. So uh, as Biddy said, I'm a child psychiatrist and my practice has always been hospital-based. I've been starting every workday for the last 38 years going into the Massachusetts General Hospital. And the work that I do has been working with, um, or early in my career with medically ill children with cancer or cystic fibrosis, and more recently predominantly working with families mm -hmm. where a parent has either cancer or ALS, and really working in partnership with parents to help them think about how to support the emotional health and well-being of their children through the parents' uh, diagnosis, care, and uh, 
often untimely death. So I had been working before always with um, the impact of a medical illness on a family, but not a contagious illness. And uh, going to the MGH every morning. So a very big change for me is instead of doing the care that I've been doing for so many years, by going to an inpatient room, by someone coming to my outpatient office in the clinic, by going to the infusion units or to the neurology clinic, suddenly I am practicing looking at a screen, practicing from my dining room where you find me now. My commute is short from the bedroom to the kitchen to the dining room, um, but it's a very different experience. The, kind of teaching that has been part of my practice all the years is, is again, hospital-based. So it's been a lot of supervision of young trainees, of colleagues. I credit my Amherst College education with having helped me to be a good communicator. And I really have uh, loved the ability to talk about what um, psychiatrists and psychologists know um, and translate it in a way to make it accessible um, for other clinicians of different sorts. And so it's the doctor year begins July 1, as it has for me for 38 years. But this year, I am meeting my new trainees, our new trainees, virtually. I'm seeing my patients virtually. I'm seeing my colleagues virtually. And uh, I think as Kim was saying, trying to make space to uh, be both grateful for the ability to stay connected in these important ways and also to grieve the loss of a certain sense of hospital-based community and colleague community that's very hard to reestablish uh, through virtual connection. And as someone who generally both by virtue of, of gray hair and by um, being on the faculty for a very long time, um, young clinicians have often looked to me for guidance about how to negotiate, how to navigate circumstances. And so I, I think one of the really big changes for me was having to really take stock within myself, get settled myself, um, to be in a position to be able to be useful um, I hope that I am always humble when I'm sitting with colleagues, patients, friends, family. I'm learning from everyone, but the need to ramp up the learning was so rapid in this circumstance to be so abruptly thrown into a different circumstance. And the, the patients and colleagues had a whole series of new questions on the um, patient front, working with families who were already stressed. Uh, because of a serious medical illness in a parent, the whole process of trying to establish a support system for children changed radically. Who could, were you going to allow in your house during a time uh, when there was a contagious disease? How were families going to function without a lot of the community support supports, including uh, in-person school, uh, faith-based communities? And then amongst my colleagues, our hospital changed radically over a very short period of time. For those of you that don't know, in Massachusetts, the surge peaked in April, but really uh, the numbers were, were substantial and we, it was impending for the month, uh, the end of March and, and into April, and the Mass General was transformed. Um, our pediatric unit became an adult COVID unit my pediatric colleagues were, te were treating adults instead of treating children. Our pediatric intensive care unit became an adult intensive care unit for COVID patients. And uh, over the last 15 years, I've done quite a bit of work with military families. For those families, instead of facing the challenge of a parent with a serious illness, they face the challenge of a parent being in harm's way because of their service and sacrifice. And, for the first time, or at least in what felt like a very different way, colleagues were coming and saying, we don't feel safe going into the hospital right now. This is a new illness. We weren't clear. It has changed in terms of what we know and our ability to help clinicians to feel safe. But for the first time, people were entering the hospital and they were needing pediatricians and primary care doctors were needing to talk to their children 
about how they were serving and being in harm's way as many of the first responders and essential workers were needing to do. So there was sort of an intersection for me of the kind of work that I had done before, um, but really feeling like that I was being called upon to answer questions, needs um, in very new ways. I really appreciate what you both said about these shifting roles and demands that I think many of us are ha have had to pivot and change directions and learn things that we haven't had to learn before. And I also, Kim, what you mentioned about the layering on top of that, of kind of coming to the realities of the racial injustices that are happening, of of things maybe not being as we hoped in so many ways. Um, it just is a lot of additional emotional bandwidth that that takes to have to sort of hold that and think about that. Um, and it really has changed the landscape of what I think many of us are doing. So both of you, in essence, the sort of part of your jobs in many ways is about promoting emotional well-being, promoting mental health um, outcomes. So. I'd like to hear a little bit about what you see as the challenges right now to mental health that we are facing in the midst of all of these concurrent crises. Um, we started with Kim last time, so maybe I'll ask Paula first. Could you talk a little bit about the challenges you see playing out here in terms of mental health? So I, I think um, the notion that the challenges have been layered, that um, there was first the uh, challenge of COVID, but that wasn't the first challenge that America's children and adolescents and all of us were experiencing. Uh, and before we really had our arms around adjusting and um, getting more accustomed to social distancing, um, trying to understand COVID, uh, there was there were the, the tragic killings um, that brought uh, another layer of injustice to the surface. Um, I, I think the backdrop is that um, anxiety and depression are common already prior to COVID amongst uh, young people, adolescents and young adults in particular. Uh, there, were, there was also a lot of angst and existential worry um, about climate change appropriately so. So uh, worries didn't start with with COVID or the unfolding events of this summer of 2020, they occurred on a backdrop of already a stressful time. Fear in general, um, it narrows one's focus and it's harder to problem solve when you're afraid because your focus is narrowed. Um, and more than ever, people need important relationships to sustain them, uh, children and adolescents uh, rely on their parents and the other caring adults in their lives. I always think about toddlers, how when a toddler bumps his or her head, they turn and look to a parent. And if the parent is, is very worried, the toddler will begin to cry. And if the parent goes, you're okay, you're okay, the, the toddler is more likely to take kind of a deep breath and uh, carry on. And we refer to that as emotional referencing we learn to emotionally reference off the people we know well. And this has been a time where everyone has been um, unsettled. Some people have suffered much more than others, but there's no one who's been unaffected during this time. And so it's been, I think, particularly important to, to think about those kinds of relationships. I, um, I spent a lot of time working with with families and with colleagues focusing on facilitating communication and how important communication is in helping someone to feel uh, that you get it um, and also to be able to um, problem solve together. And um, in sort of a overarching way, when facing adversity, if, if one faces adversity within a relationship, it's possible to integrate even very difficult things as challenges that can build life skills. There are certainly things we wouldn't have picked, but there's the possibility to grow through that time. If, if adversity is experienced feeling isolated, helpless and hopeless, it's much more likely to get integrated as a trauma. And so 
we all need to be reaching out to each other and finding, both using old ways and new ways uh, to support each other through the evolving challenges of the last few months and, and frankly, the challenges that we anticipate in the months ahead. And how about for I you, think, Kim? Yeah, so, so much of what Paula is sharing with us about the experience of stress and trauma just uh, can't be said often enough, you know. We, um, I mean, one of the challenges is that uh, under normal circumstances, stress serves as a signal, right? It tells you that there is some uh, danger in your midst and you can take evasive action and then your stress will decrease. But that's not what's happened in the last months for us. Even uh, early on in the pandemic, the very um, actions that kept us safe staying at home, sheltering in place, also it exposed us to new dangers from um, uh, the challenge, uh, if you were fortunate enough to be able to work at home, but also had to take care of kids at home, that challenge was stressful, even as it was keeping you safe. And if you weren't able to work at home, uh, were a first responder, a frontline worker, whether it's a physician, a nurse, or driving a bus for that matter, or working in a grocery store, uh, then you faced a different set of uh, challenges that you had to bear and, and uh, a different calculus that you had to make. So st our, our experience of stress has also been, uh, I think, altered by the very fact that we've gone from one kind of stress, a pandemic, to then an economic recession that differentially has impacted different communities and different people and different families. And then to the stress of recognizing that the country in which we live is, um, uh, continues to struggle with significant forms of systemic racism and uh, institutional barriers to opportunity and success. And if we think about stress this way, a friend of mine describes it as like a coffee table. The more you put on a coffee table, at a certain point, it becomes overburdened. So that's been the experience of many in our communities of just as you get accustomed to one part of the stress you have to, uh, of the, the, the crisis, you have to start coping with something else. And I would say, if we think about what's been happening most recently in our country, there's ample evidence that racism affects people who are subject to it uh, as a specific stressor. And there are you know, uh, evidence-based uh, research that shows that um, uh, a link between racism and psychological distress, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression. And for uh, many people of color in this country, for example, and those who feel closely allied with them, uh, what happened to George Floyd uh, became a collective trauma. And again, particularly for people of color and particularly for black Americans. And there is uh, research that's just coming out that shows that the symptoms of anxiety and depression in non-Hispanic black adults rose to 40% or so from May to June, and it remains uh, elevated. So, um, what we've seen though is that um, uh, on the other side of this, and there is sometimes growth that happens in the midst of trauma, that structural racism and anti-black racism have become a thing that we could all see. In a way, uh, what, what has happened is that we now recognize we are in the midst of a collective problem. And this is just my own take on this. You know, I think uh, many Americans are moved to action on behalf of the particular and on behalf of specific injustices, particularly ones that they can see with their own eyes. George Floyd's murder occurred on camera. And for eight minutes and 46 seconds, we watched a man slowly be suffocated to death. Now, possibly, and this is just uh, a thought, possibly at a time when we're all attuned to the horrors of losing breath with COVID-19, this had special meaning. Possibly it was a tipping point. These kinds of punitive policing situations and officer-involved deaths have happened many, many times. And of course, sustained attention by activists uh, has helped uh, the issues that we're working with right now become right. But the 
promising thing perhaps in the midst of uh, tragedy and pain has been that as structural racism has become more of a collective problem and as various organizations and institutions has seen it as something that belongs to them as well, uh, there have been important new developments where uh, we recognize at an institutional level, it's not just inadequate diversity, but we really need to look at the structural barriers that are baked into so many of our, of our uh, systems. So there is stress, um, but there is also recognition of perhaps some new capacity and some new tools. And I think that's at the system level, uh, the country level, and also for some of us uh, individually in our personal lives as well. Thank you so much, Kim. I think you're so right that much of this is laid bare, what needs to shift and the problematic institutional things that exist. And so I think those are important things for us to keep in mind. You know, this also reminds me partially as the, the professor um, at Amherst College about how these stressors are also exacerbated by the social isolation. You know, I know that especially for our students being, most of them are home, they're not together in their shared spaces. And with these events that have unfolded, especially around the racial injustices taking place, conversation, social support, enga active engagement is so critical. And I think for Amherst College students, they are scattered in a way that makes some of those connections much more difficult. And I think even similarly, when we think about processing what is challenging, the potential traumas that are existing, and I think for our students too, they go home to very different environments. And so it also may mean that what they are experiencing this summer at home, their friends and peers may not really have the same context because they're in a very different environment. And so there isn't that shared space that, that they're in on campus and together to help them maybe process together and see each other's points of views as much. And I think that really also affects this. Um, We've talked a little bit about then this sort of intersection between these different pieces. And I wondered though, if um, Paula, you had anything more to add about how you see these layers intersecting in terms of um, the clinical side and the impact that these multiple stressors may be having in your patients? Are there things that are different right now that you're observing? So I think some of the interesting things um, at the, at the outset, one of the things that surprised me when I was talking with um, parents with cancer in the middle of March, I was expecting them, and, and let me first say everybody is an individual and I, it, it always worries me when I'm making generalizations, but I'm gonna share mm -hmm. a couple of points because I think they might be, a, uh, might be interesting to think about. So some of the cancer um, affected parents said, uh, you know, the rest of America is experiencing what I've been experiencing right along. I haven't felt safe. I've been worried being immunocompromised, worried about infection. So the difference between America with COVID and America without COVID, um, for me, for that uh, person living with cancer and the risk of COVID um, at the outset didn't feel as big as uh, the risk to health um, and family of the cancer diagnosis. So that was um, uh, that. That was a note to me to to um, continue to be curious, not to come forward with with um, assumptions. I think uh, amongst some of my colleagues, it was it was very important to make time to hear. Uh, what was going on in each individual person's life and to give people permission to be sad about um, family milestones um, that weren't going to happen, the specific things that, individual things that were hard. I think it was difficult, it remains difficult. Um, uh, when one feels grateful for privilege to um, also make space for uh, the ambiguous grief that goes along with milestones that that uh, just couldn't happen as they were anticipated, and lots of challenges around saying goodbye, not in person. So um, there, it was not possible for, for the most part, for any family member to go in. 
um, to many places, to um, nursing homes, uh, mostly to the hospital to say goodbye. Uh, all kinds of things were put in place um, with iPads and other um, virtual attempts, but uh, it was painful to um, be facing these, these new ways of having to say goodbye. I, I feel like um, as people have adjusted a little bit to this new normal, um, people's creativity has sprung up in all kinds of ways um, and, and people are not so shocked. They're trying to figure out ways they're learning um, from each other. Um, and then I think um, I, I found myself talking um, both in uh, lectures to primary care uh, mm -hmm. physicians and pediatricians about how to talk to their own children about being in harm's way uh, in, this, in this new way. And just to share uh, language that we've used um, together uh, with those who have deployed into um, harm's way, I encouraged parents to talk about what they were doing, why they were going to the hospital, what their jobs were, or what their first responder jobs were, or working in a supermarket, what, wherever the um, frontline work was, how providing that service to the community connected to loving their child and wanting their child to live in a place where uh, food was available to people, where, where people in the hospital got the kind of care that they would want family members to have. And then um, I think head, heart, and hand, and the hand is the implementation part. And here are the ways I'm doing that safely. Here are the people that I'm working side by side with that I trust. And so um, in that way, it was kind of bringing together uh, military experience with uh, facilitating communication, uh, in, all in the service of um, trying in particular to support young people. Well, I have I a wonder, question. Oh yeah, I was gonna ahead. ask you a question, Julia, about sure. um, how Amherst has responded to some of the needs of students. I'm hoping to hear kind of some of the things that are happening during this unprecedented time. Yes. yes, you know, I, we're, we're thinking a lot about the cognitive load and the emotional load on students, which we anticipate to be present moving forward and not changing. And so on the academic side, um, we've reduced the course load to three courses per semester instead of four, uh, really in recognition that we want students to be engaged and successful in their coursework, but that everything takes more effort. I think it, you know, it relays back to what both of you were saying at the beginning is that for students too, they have to learn a new modality and way to engage academically. And that's going to take more time. It's not as natural. It has some challenges to it. And so we know that students are going to be grappling with that in courses and we want to try to make them as successful as possible in that. Um, and we're also now, um, we're also um, having some greater flexibility in terms of um, the grading that we're, we're providing to students so that students have an opportunity to take a course um, pass fail. Um, and part of that is also in recognition of the uncertainties of what's happening and that a student may find themselves ill or have a family member ill. And also that students are, are taking our courses now in many different locations that, you know, that social support may not always be there, that they may not always have, you know, a private space to work. And so just trying to make accommodations and flexibility. Um, many of us faculty are also thinking a lot about a greater responsibility in our courses for social connection, the things that happen organically on a small college campus that we don't have to actually manage so much as professors. The students are very good at that, that we are now having to be much more systematic in promoting those kinds of things. Um, and so that's the side, on the side of the academics, some of the things that are being done. And then the um, Counseling Center has done a tremendous job of supporting students, I think, through um, this crisis. The um, loosening of restrictions around telehealth has allowed for many students to continue to see um, counselors in our counseling session. In some states where that isn't been possible, the Counseling Center has helped students to try to interface with local um, um, therapists. And then there's also support groups that are ongoing and that I think they're going to be even more of those because again, of this piece of the, the social support. And something that I've been trying to sort of communicate to students and demystify is some of this normalizing of the emotional load that's taking place and that 
it is okay to prioritize self-care, to engage in self-care, that that has to become a more active priority than maybe we, we, we were doing previously. Um, and so I think that we're at least very mindful of it um, and in trying to sort of create opportunities for students also to come together and discuss some of these topics around racial injustice. There's been a big push for faculty um, to have more courses um, this year that really touch on those issues related to those subject matters. And so, and I think there's been a lot of responses from students. I think at Amherst particularly, students make, make sense and meaning in their academic work. And so having academic opportunities for us to have these conversations um, and come together about those subject matters, I think is really critical for Amherst College students and I think they've been hungry for them. So we're trying to, to get there for that. Um, yeah. I have one other question for the two of you. You know, I think we've we've touched on that clearly there's more mental health challenges um, going on right now. Do you perceive these as long lasting effects or do you think that things will dissipate? Well, I think it's hard to know. And that's one of the uh, challenges right now. We, we certainly know that in other um, big disruptions that the imprint of those last for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And certainly students now whose uh, academic uh, engagement has been transformed by COVID and by the other crises as well, will never forget that. Um, it will always be a, a part of their college experience. The other part of that mm -hmm. is that they are now part of a, a cohort mm -hmm. who shares something in common with students across the country and across the globe. And I think um, two thoughts that I also had about this is that, you know, I think many of our students, our, our trainees, uh, residents and so forth, have also had the experience of watching us try to learn, use new technology, uh, be beginners again in a variety of ways. And at least what I've heard from some of my students is how very much they've appreciated that, that it has narrowed the gap uh, you know, that sometimes exists uh, when you have a professor, a student, or a doctor, a patient. Um, and so that there has been this kind of bringing together of, of people, even in their uh, effort to try to um, uh, engage uh, in very different ways. I, I would also say that um, when we think about the imprint we, uh, of, of this experience, uh, we can only, um, we, we, we can think of it in two ways. We can think about uh, all that people have given up and all that they have to grieve, but there are also incredible things that students and others have done of using technology to make a difference in their local communities or in communities across the country or across the globe. Some of my students have organized, for example, to think about services like domestic violence shelters that are not open right now. And what can they do uh, as a student group to work with others to help create virtual opportunities for safety in other ways, just as an if, for example. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that what I hope the imprint will be is that the tremendous creativity and of a willingness uh, to begin to tackle really important problems that, uh, you know, in, in many instances we put off uh, contending with from making sure that we were really prepared for a pandemic to the issues that we're needing to uh, really interrogate around race and racism uh, in our country and also around the globe. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, so we are going to transition over now to some of the questions that audience members have, have submitted to us. Um, so the first question is one directed towards Paula. Um, so putting safety aside in psychiatry, how do you weigh the pros and cons of video full face versus in-person and masked? <laughs> So um, with my experience now of what, two and a half months, um, I think uh, in, in, uh, in all seriousness, the real challenge is for young children. 
doing at least um, Zoom related virtual visits for most younger children is hard to do. It's different to be playing with a child doing play therapy in an office than it is um, to uh, be doing that on a screen. Uh, so I think there are certain populations for whom it really is a challenge. So younger kids, kids with a variety of developmental delays, I think families that have been living with uh, the challenges of a child with autism, particularly severe autism, having lost the structure of school, um, those families are really um, struggling and uh, doing amazing things, but, but also it's been very difficult. I think there are many adolescents who actually have a appreciated being um, on the virtual screen and doing uh, telehealth. And uh, I haven't done the face-to-face -face visits with masks on. So in some ways that would be a different challenge to not be able to uh, see a teenager's or child's face, to be able to read um, an important part of their reaction. Um, so I, I would say in a lot of ways, it's uh, stay tuned. Um, I, I think uh, we're going to be learning a lot um, over the next months, weeks, months. Um, there are other places, Canada, for example, does way more telehealth than um, we have done. Uh, there's been a move to do more telehealth here in the States for a while. Um, I was uh, slow to agree to do that. Um, it took a pandemic to get me to switch to all virtual, but I am uh, recognizing that there are um, there are aspects of it that work well, but um, I am having to learn to feel my patients in the same way through a screen and to have a sense of whether they feel me as being with them in that way that I was talking about before of being um, in a relationship that um, is settling and helps someone to problem solve or to be, feel understood. So um, I would like to have a, um, a better answer, but I would say it's pretty much stay tuned um, and yes and no. And if I could just jump in there, you know, I think one of the uh, interesting uh, dimensions of telehealth, as Paula said, is that it's not only that individual clinicians may have been reluctant to put it into practice, uh, there were all kinds of institutional barriers. And right. lo and behold, within about two weeks, we managed to innovate and get past those barriers. It was really a quite extraordinary thing for our profession. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question is about screen use. Um, so I've read that screen use adds to depression. Can you think of ways to counteract this and in the increased need for screen time? I'm, I'm wondering if that's more of a child question. If it is, yeah. I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> so um, there are all, you know, there, there are all different kinds of screen time. So um, I, I think there are, oh, screens have been used as a way for kids to stay connected with each other, um, to stay connected with their classmates, to be doing yoga. Um, I think there are, uh, there are many active ways to be engaged and also ways to be engaged both with peers, um, with some adult um, engagement as well that have been positive. And then I think we all, whether it's kids or adults, uh, we need to pay attention to our physical health and sitting in front of a screen and not um, you know, at, at the expense of exercise, at the expense of um, being artistic or reading or doing other things um, is going to be um, a problem. So screen time necessarily has gone up um, for, for children and families can only do what they can do. It's not, you know, people are really making do in very difficult circumstances. And I think picking one factor, like you can only be on a screen a certain amount of time um, defeats uh, the purpose, it's, it's better to think more globally about ways to support um, emotional health than to get too fixated on an amount of time of screen time. But think of screen time as like a diet. It's not, it's not a problem 
to have screen time, but what else is in your interpersonal diet? What can you do together as a family? Um, what are things to do uh, solo that um, are energy and emotionally enhancing? Um, so with the pandemic, do you think there's actually less stigma around seeking mental health therapy, particularly in communities of color? I would say that um, the accessibility of telemental health when it is available to people has moved in that direction of making treatment less of a stigma. Uh, as I understand it, um, you know, uh, people who might have put off getting care for substance use through a 12-step program, for example, have found it uh, a, a, an easier um, way to get care by dialing it up on their screen. So that's a, an advantage of, of being able to seek care through screens. Um, in communities of color, I, I would say that um, over the last while, particularly among young people, uh, 18 uh, in, in, into their 20s, have begun to have a different attitude about mental health care. They see it as a, a, a way to um, expand their own capacity um, and they see it as part of a social justice agenda. So uh, over the last while, um, what you've seen with um, college age populations is uh, much more of an openness to mental health care. Still not so uh, much um, in uh, pervasively through communities of color. Um, there is significant distrust of the healthcare profession, but um, from organizations like the Black Women's Health Imperative to groups that are trying to use music and um, uh, media in order to uh, in, may be more inviting, I think that we're beginning to see uh, some changes in uh, how mental health care is perceived within communities of color. And I do think that uh, the, it, for some families, you know, uh, to be able to not have to worry about bundling it, uh, a family in the car to get to the hospital or get to the clinic makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think there also um, has been some movement towards um, uh, a greater understanding of kind of mind body. Um, I have heard and have had other colleagues comment that some individuals who um, previously were convinced that their physical symptoms had no psychological connection, in the context of COVID, they're suddenly saying, oh, you know, maybe um, some of these physical symptoms that I am having are not uh, just medical. Maybe it has to do with how anxious I've been feeling. And so mm -hmm. um, maybe there are some opportunities there, both um, around building on mind-body practices that enhance wellness and also recognizing the connection between um, uh, physical symptoms and emotional health. I would say too, in my classroom, uh, especially during March and early April, um, as students were actively trying to orient themselves, um, they were telling stories of positive coping and not so positive coping and sharing that among their peers. And I think um, the pandemic, and again, the sense of we're, there's a collective uh, challenge um, uh, has been, uh, it's created a platform for people's emotional experiencing to be relevant. And I would say the same during the civil unrest and protest as people have been struggling with a myriad of feelings from anger and rage to shock and dismay or various combinations of those, uh, they've come to recognize that um, their emotional health is necessary to cultivate um, just as their physical health is necessary to cultivate in order to have the kind of community impact that they hope to have down now and down the line. I think those are really excellent points. So I'm gonna, throw out one final question for all of us, um, try to end on a high note. Um, what are some of the things that students and alumni and their families can be doing to support um, their own emotional well-being as well as the emotional well-being of those around them? Uh, I'll start. So I, I think the basic things are the things that we know, um, but often are the ones that we don't 
do. Um, things that have to do, for example, with maintaining a regular routine, going to sleep at a regular time, eating healthful, regular meals, um, prioritizing family time or time with, uh, um, whether it's family by birth or family by choice, but um, people with whom you enjoy spending time, whether that's you know eating a meal on Zoom or whether it's watching a movie together side by side, um, prioritizing talking time, um, in your household. So um, parents and kids, particularly parents can usually tell you the times that um, they're most likely to have a good conversation with their child and prioritizing those times as the important grownups in a child or adolescent or young person's life. I always think about the importance that uh, in communication, you're doing more listening than you are talking. Um, I think limiting the amount of media having a healthy media diet and modeling that, not being all the time getting um, flooding information. Um, when we did a uh, study after the Boston Marathon bombing, one of the things that we learned from parents was that for their adolescents, because the adolescents were getting their information so quickly, sometimes parents of adolescents, and I think this is true of young adults, um, misunderstand the difference between um, knowing something and processing it together. So just because a teenager or a young adult um, has the information, often they have more information and they're teaching us, or at least that's my experience with my own children and, and now grandchildren. Um, but spending the time to process it um, together, doing the self-regulation things, the mind-body things, meditation, prayer, um, art, journaling, the, um, for me, getting to that place of being settled and knowing for myself, when am I in that settled place? And for me, if I'm not curious, I'm not settled. So that's like a, that's something I know, gratitude, um, uh, feeling okay about moments of joy, not feeling guilty about finding joy. Um, and then also not utilizing um, dangerous coping strategies and you know, the ones that jump to mind, alcohol and and drugs and and if someone feels helpless or hopeless or overwhelmed, um, reach out for help. And if the first reach out doesn't work, reach out again. And after that, again. I think that's a terrific uh, portfolio of uh, of actions, activities that that anyone can make use of. You know, I'll 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 highlight maybe just two of the ones that Paula has has mentioned. You know. Um, I've heard anecdotally from a lot of people that during these last months, they have reached out to old friends from the past that they may not have been in touch with for quite some time. They've reached out to relatives that perhaps they only saw once or twice a year. That connectivity, that reconstituting your network, I think has also been something that, that many people have been able to do and that they found that um, a new joy that's come out of this uh, time of so much otherwise loss. And then around the journaling, what I would mention is uh, how important it is really to uh, develop a perspective on your own experience. And that's one of the uh, outcomes of journaling. There's a psychologist at Texas, James Pennebaker, who writes a lot about, uh, he writes about expressive writing. And expressive writing, it allows you to step back from your own experience and develop a take on it, very much like what you get in the context of talking with a therapist or a counselor. Only now you're able to, through the act of writing, be able to acquire that kind of perspective yourself. You know, and I will add just from my own research, which focuses on how parents can socialize children around emotions that I think even within these challenging moments are opportunities, particularly for children and adolescents to learn, to learn about emotions, to learn about how are the healthy and good ways to cope with emotions? What am I going to do with them? And similarly, other folks are doing some really wonderful research on the opportunities that come from talking about racial inequities with young children, of having these conversations that are really important learning opportunities. And so I think that also that can promote resilience, but also sort of knowledge and understanding. Um, so I, so I'm, I'm hearing that. Okay, so um, we, so it sounds like I am going to be giving some of the closing remarks. So I wanted to just um, 
ask if either of you had anything that you wanted to end with. Oh, okay. Biddy is ready. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I'm going to say thank you so much (laughs) to um, both Paula and Kim. I know that I've learned a lot and have really been so grateful to hear your expertise on these subject matters. And I'm going to turn this back over to Biddy Martin to to finish us off for the evening. (laughs) Well, you know what? I feel, Julia, like handing it right back to you because you were about to say something that I would really like to hear. I have not. I am, no, I feel good. I feel satisfied with this conversation. And so I'm in a good place. Okay. Well, it was a wonderful conversation. It, it, it certainly has, um, has helped me. I feel a lot calmer at the end of this program than I did when we started. So thank you all. Thank you for the information, for the obvious compassion, for the insight, for the intelligence. Thank you. I I hope perhaps we can count on all three of you again, um, given the times. In any case, I also want everyone in the audience to mark your calendars and join us next week, Tuesday, July 28th for a conversation about student research in machine learning. Machine learning being the algorithm-driven technology that's used for everything from self-driving cars to credit card transactions. Uh, A professor of computer science, Scott Alfeld, will be our speaker and he will have a moderator from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, Nick Horton. I know having listened to them both that it will be a very enlivening and extremely informative conversation. Paula and Kim and Julia, thank you again for everything you do, not just for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It was my my pleasure, terrific to be in conversation with everyone here tonight. Absolutely.